Hey guys, I uh, I need to make a confession. It's it's not easy for me to say on here, but I know that I need to take accountability. So um, I'm a really big Lord of the Rings fan. You know, in case you couldn't tell, I love the Lord of the Rings in all of its many varied forms, but the movies hold a very special place in my heart. Such a special place, in fact, that some citizens of the internet have accused me of favoring them or giving them special treatment. Which I absolutely do. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I do, and I'm not really gonna apologize for it. I mean, what are you gonna do? Read at me? But I can acknowledge that the movies aren't perfect. So today I'm going to lend myself a little bit more legitimacy by pointing out some of those things that make them so imperfect. Or at least the things that personally make me mad. I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and here are a few of the things that I hate about the Lord of the Rings movies. And I'm only gonna talk about nine of these things for each of the circles of hell. And, and not just because I couldn't think of a tenth one. Why would I do that? That would be, that'd be weird. Now let's start off with a big one, or at least one that's big for me personally, the Urukai. And I hear you crying out, Jess, why do you dislike the Urukai? Is it their design, their characterization, the annoying but inevitable changes that occur when you change a story from one medium to another? No, no, no. It's because I think they're gross. It's this guy in particular. This one deeply scarred me as a youth, and sometimes when I close my eyes and I'm trying to sleep at night, I still see it there branded onto the back of my eyelids. He's just so slimy and membranous and wet. And like, I, I get it, he's definitely supposed to be really gross, but Man, that's a lot. Not to mention the fact that Saruman is just down there hanging out in his all white robes. He didn't have like an apron he could put on, overalls he could change into, an old t-shirt. Like I'm sure he's got, you know, hundreds of Tide pens up in Orthanc, but you know what Tide pens can't hide? The smell. Trust me. I know. And now for an admittedly more legitimate complaint, let's talk about Frodo and Sam in the last two movies. This part has always been a really hard watch for me, and I know it it's probably supposed to feel long and arduous and exhausting, and it is. But to switch from Merry and Pippin riding trees into warfare to gorgeous battle scenes featuring gorgeous, gorgeous Viggo Mortensen, <laughs> To just, you know, two guys climbing a mountain while another guy dry heaves in the background? It's a tough sell. And to make matters worse, you have to sit through that part where Frodo sends Sam away because he thinks he's eaten the Lembus bread or wants to take the ring or whatever, and that has always been a very, very tough scene for me. And it's not necessarily because I don't like the inclusion of that moment as a whole. That's gonna need a whole separate video about it, but I don't resent the fact that they changed that part of the plotline. I just find it really sad, cringy. You know how everyone talks about that episode of The Office, Scott's Tots, that is so horrifically cringy that they skip it on rewatches? This is my Scott's Tots. And sure, it serves the story in a new and interesting way, but at what cost? My heart? Is that worth it, Peter Jackson? Fun fact, the Finnish version of The Lord of the Rings, which I put myself through for the sake of this channel, entirely follows Frodo and Sam after the breaking of the Fellowship, which is probably why watching it felt like nails on a chalkboard for me. It could have also been Smeagol's balls. That, that probably didn't help. Either way, this brings us to our next point, point seven, which is um, more specific and also more reprehensible. That moment with the elven cloak. And look, I get it, I get it. It is an elven cloak. It helps them hide. But that right there, that is not hiding. That is turning into a rock. It's like a worse version of that scene in The Hunger Games where Peta uh, lays down and disguises himself as a riverbed. Side note, that scene is incredibly disturbing and is another one that um, really imprinted itself in my brain. Because like, if I was out in the woods and I saw somebody's face in the riverbed like that, I'd stomp it. Like, I. I I'd stop it. Anyway, this is not supposed to be a Hunger Games channel. Every time I have watched a new person watch that scene with the cloak, they are 
utterly baffled by it. Because if you were like uh, 18 inches away from a guy wearing camo, pretty safe bet that you're gonna still be able to see the guy wearing camo. No, 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 no. This cloak isn't just camouflaging them against unfriendly eyes. This is a magic trick. And elven cloaks don't really do magic tricks. They do illusions. The trick is something a whore does for money. <laughs> Item number six is what I like to call the Beyblade Wizards. Beyblade, Beyblade, let it rip. This whole scene between Gandalf and Saruman is so serious and so well performed that this moment just cuts the tension like a knife. A clown knife. A knife for clowns. Used by clowns or against clowns. Kinda like the moment in Marvel movies when someone just like committed a war crime or whatever and then they look at the camera and go, erm, so that just happened. That's an exact quote, right? I'm really not caught up on Marvel movies, I'm sorry guys. I believe that most of the time, practical effects are a far better choice than any alternative, but if you get yourself to a point where you are spinning Ian McKellen around on the floor by his ankles, I just think you might want to take a step back and reassess some things. My next complaint is about Aragorn and Arwen. Now I talk about this a lot more in another video, but I think that Arwen's character and her relationship with Aragorn is just handled really clumsily by the filmmakers. They started out really strong by beefing up her role in Fellowship, giving her a much larger role in the movies than she ever had in the books. Then movie two rolls around and they immediately step her way back, instead only really sprinkling her through these weird lucid dreaming moments with Aragorn. And it's not like there weren't places where they could have put her back into the narrative. I know that they recorded some footage of her fighting at Helm's Deep, which would have been a little bit weird, but you also could have had her join Elrond when he brings Aragorn his sword, because he was supposed to receive a banner and a message from her at that point anyway, so she totally could have come back into the story, but whatever, I digress. Even worse than that, in my opinion, they also turn Aragorn and Arwen's romance into this weird, like, will they, won't they? Because he's not totally sure if she's going to be leaving him for the Undying Lands. And this whole will they, won't they dynamic just really doesn't work for them. I guess if you really, really needed that dynamic in the story for some reason, you probably could have drawn out uh, Aragorn and Eowyn a little bit more, but Aragorn and Arwen ended up feeling like a weird, underexplained footnote when that could have been the central romance of the story. It takes such a backseat that by the time you're watching Aragorn and Eowyn together, you're left wondering like, well, why isn't he just going with her? Now number four on this list is the endings. Endings. These movies have a lot of endings. Every time you think that this trilogy is drawing to a close, you get another ending. And then another one. And then another one. And then, uh, yeah, you get the point. Now, for full transparency, um, I do cry through every one of these endings, like, hysterically, for the last uh, about two hours of The Return of the King. It's just full-on bawling. But... That doesn't mean I don't think it's a little excessive. Obviously, this redundancy of endings is something that they originally drew from the book, plot-wise, but it also comes down to a matter of editing. Movies use visual and audio cues in order to signal certain things to the audience. And because we've all seen, you know, the ending scene of a movie, we know as audience members what that's supposed to look like. You have slow motion and emotional music and friends being reunited at last. All of these things happen in one scene in The Return of the King, but then there's still another, like, hour left of the movie. And don't get me wrong, I know that the fact that they have so many endings is really key to how Tolkien writes story in regard to his use of you catastrophe to create a perfectly happy ending, but it still really hurts to cry for that long, and I know that it confuses a lot of moviegoers to have this kind of stop and start ending. Now, speaking of exhausting and repetitive, we have number three on this list, Frodo's deaths. I don't know if any character has fake died and then revealed that he's actually alive as many times as Frodo did throughout the Lord of the Rings trilogy. We are now going to watch a clip of each of these fake deaths accompanied with a live recreation of how I feel about them. Ooh. 
Ooh, that was a little scary. Ooh, ouch, that's gonna, it's gonna leave a mark. Ah, yeah, he's fine. Well, I think, there's no way he's gonna be dead. Oh my god, did they just... He's fine. He's fine. I think I found the <laughs> you can't do that to me. <laughs> Suffice to say, it's redundant. And by the end, it, it really loses the impact and the fear that they might have been able to build. It does still make me cry, but that's not the point. At number two, we have the ghost scene. And listen, there are two things that I love in this world. The Lord of the Rings extended edition and Lil Ghosts. But the extended edition sequence about the ghosts, it, um, it just, it just gets to be a little much. It all starts to go downhill when we see these ghostly hands creeping up and Gimli starts trying to blow them away, which is pretty funny. I guess, but um, this is not really the time for goofs and gaffs, is it? Also, this implies that ghosts have some sort of a corporeal form where the, the movement of wind could affect them. I'm no expert in the subject, but I think that if we could just leaf blow away all of our ghosts, we would have much, much shorter horror movies. Remember Poltergeist? You just put a fan in every room and yeah, you're good to go. Next, they make a really big deal out of Gimli walking on a pile of skulls. Now, is this something that I would want to do in my free time? I mean, no. But I just feel like Gimli has probably stomped on a few skulls in his time and they really milk this scene, you know, having him crunch along the pile of skulls with all the grace of a linebacker. This is all to say, poor Gimli, sacrificed in the name of slapstick comedy. And then finally, we have the Skullvalanche. And for me, this is very nearly on the level of the barrel scene in The Hobbit, where it's so bad that it's good, but it's just, it's not quite there yet. For one, I feel like it is physically impossible that they didn't just get plowed off that ledge by that skull avalanche. I mean, I personally have never been hit with that many human skulls, but I don't think I would be able to keep my balance either way. Then again, it's possible that I'm looking a little too hard for realism in a scene ripped straight out of Army of Darkness. Is that a good reference here? Cause uh, I asked Dylan for it and that's what he gave me. Let's just roll a clip from it here. <laughs> Is that a real movie? But speaking of impossible physics, let's talk about my biggest pet peeve from these movies, Legolas. And I guess maybe this shouldn't be this high on my list, because despite how world-breakingly unrealistic some of his moves are, he won me over. Legolas has officially reached the level of the barrel scene in the Hobbit movies for me. It is the level of, um, admiration. We'll go with that. Cause you see the little flip he does to get around on the horse, you're rolling your eyes at that point. And then when he goes Tony Hawking down the stairs of Helm's Deep, it's possible that you're scoffing a little. But you cannot convince me that by the time he was single-handedly taking down a mama kill and sticking that CGI landing, that you weren't cheering for him a little bit. I mean, it's objectively probably dumb and like not good, but man, those wacky moves bring me so much delight. And I guess that might end up kind of becoming my thesis here. I've had these movies in my life for, well, my whole life. So even the things that annoy me a little bit have kind of become endearing. It's like a weird family member that you can't help but like, you know? One that has a, a ring and three separate plots and orcs in them. Okay, that analogy fell apart a little bit, but you get my point. I probably let these movies off a little bit too easily, and I, I, I try to be conscious of that, and I try to acknowledge that where I think it's necessary, but to be honest, I don't really care. People are so quick to dismiss the film adaptation of a book as a lesser version of the story, but there really is an undeniable magic to film. It presents us with a world that can seem so real and immersive, 
that even the absurd seems possible in that moment. It has the ability to transport us to a different place, a different time, a different world. And that kind of escapist, transformative magic complements Tolkien's Middle Earth beautifully. Anyway, as a self-proclaimed casual enjoyer of most things, even the most egregious mistakes in The Lord of the Rings don't ruin all the good that they bring me. Except that Urukai in the slime bath. Yeah, that really f***ed me up. Either way, I know you guys are gonna have thoughts, so please, please share them with me in the comments. Even if I'm not able to reply to every single one of your comments, I do read all of them, and I really love hearing what you guys have to say. So please do share your Lord of the Rings movies pet peeves, because I want to see if there's any that I forgot. Subscribe if you agree to any of the points that I made here, or if you too think that the barrel scene in The Hobbit is a work of art, and be sure to like this video because it really, really helps out the channel. Thank you all so much for joining me today, and I hope that you all have a very happy happy hobbity day.